I didn't notice, but I guess y'all did. So, so I guess we'll go ahead and get started this morning. Uh, even uh, nobody from praise team is here, so I guess we'll just go ahead. And that just means I get more time to preach. Amen. Yes, sir. That's a good deal. But uh, it's good to be in the Lord's house. Amen. And it's yes, good to be sir. here. Um, you know, even though that we're it's hot in here, I, I was just thinking as I sit back there. A lot of people in this world are having church a lot more work, worse places than we are. I mean, yes. um, yeah. in bunkers and in uh, underground shelters, things like that. Yeah. So don't don't let the heat distract you from the Lord. Um, the Lord Jesus is still here. Uh, the Holy Spirit's here. So don't you know if you get hot, there's plenty of water back there to drink. But let the Holy Spirit cool you off. Amen. I will say that. But it's so good to be in the Lord's house. And I just want to, I'll go ahead and open up in prayer. Um, if y'all just bow your heads and before we begin the message, I'll just go ahead and pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day, for your many blessings. We thank you, Lord, for just who you are. And we thank you, God, that you are in this building this uh, this evening. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, how you are moving and dwelling among us, and how you are just, just enhancing our worship and enhancing us as we go forward in this call. I just ask you, Lord, as we uh, begin this uh, this message tonight, Lord, first off, Lord, this is your message. This is your time. This is not mine. Lord, get us out of the way because, Lord, I want you to take center stage. But help us, Father God, to... Just to open our hearts to what you have us to learn and what you want us to, to hear. And just help us, God, to apply it to our lives and to help us, Lord, in these last days that we live. And we ask all these things in your loving and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. If you have a Bible, from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1. And I'm going to re read through the book of Nehemiah. So we're going to do sort of a, a real quick overview, so to speak. Uh, as, I, as I was you know, studying what the Lord me to preach about. He, he led me to this book in Nehemiah. Now, first off, I love the book in Nehemiah. It's an amazing book. And um, as I was reading this, you know, you know, it goes along with what James has been talking about. If you've not noticed in the Bible, uh, it's always a remnant group that sees God move. Amen? Yes, sir. It's always a remnant group that sees miraculous miracles. Um, for example, we got Daniel. Daniel was a remnant leader. Uh, David was a remnant leader. Um, all these different people. And so, so God works through remnant leadership. He works through remnant people. So, you know, oftentimes we think, well, remnant's a really small word. We think that's just a small group of people. But in fact, it means so much more than that. It means that you are part of something special, that yes. you are part of a group that God is going to use in these latter days. So don't ever think that being a part of a remnant group is a small thing. It's absolutely huge and amazing. And we should never, uh, never think small with the Lord Jesus. Amen? Because when He thinks, He thinks big. He does big. That's who He is. So Nehemiah it was a remnant leader, just like we, just like we are in this in this uh, day and age we live in today. And I love how biblical model just, just just screams, and, and you know what Jamie's been talking about, what you know what what's been going on Wednesday nights. So it's just amazing how you open up the Word of God, you read it, and boom, it just hits. And it just fits so well with what's going on. So if I could title this message uh, in any way, I, I want to call it Remnant Builders. And uh, do, you, do you believe that we're called to build? Amen? Yes, sir. Right. God's called us to build um, many different things. Relationships with, with fellow believers in Christ. He's called us to build spiritual barriers of safety for our families. You have the authority in Jesus Christ to, to ask for spiritual protection over your family. Do you believe that? Um, you really do. Don't ever think that you don't have that authority. Um, you know, I pray over your kids or your household. You have the authority to build that spiritual barrier. So not only that, we have the authority... To rebuild this region. Yes. And we tell you what, this region is uh, it's crumbling pretty fast. I mean, I'm not saying that to be negative, but I'm saying that to, to sort of get us on the same page that as like, while we're in this, this church praying and, and, and seeking the Lord at the same time, we need to make sure that we're, we're bringing out here into the community because this community that we live in, and you don't really, it's so easy to ignore the problems of a region until you start actually start seeing things firsthand. When they started Saturday Night Prayers, uh, Haley had a bunch of different facts up on the board, and I really wish I'd had those facts, and, and I can't really name off what, what she mentioned, but she mentioned drug addiction, you know, family abuse, she mentioned alcoholism, all these different things, and all that's in our region. It, it wasn't, you know, national statistics, it was local statistics. So, so guys, I just want to say that our region is it's broken, it's broken down, yeah. but God has given us the authority to rebuild it, amen? Yes. That's what we're going to look at tonight. Yeah with uh, Nehemiah. So chapter 1, verse 1. And by the way, the word Nehemiah means the Lord comforts. Aren't you glad he's a comforting God? Say amen. amen. Um, 
Now, I don't know about you, and I'll just be honest with you. I've, the devil's fought me pretty hard these past few weeks. If, if he has you, raise your hand. It's okay. It's okay to say the devil fights because he fights. That's what he does. But I love how when the devil fights, the Lord's comfort is so much more greater. And he's comforted me so much. And I just thank him so much for that. So, the word Nehemiah means comfort. But we'll, we'll start with verse 1. Then the words of Nehemiah, the son of Ahekali, it came to pass in the month of Chesley, in the twentieth year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanina, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So he's asking, you know, Nehemiah is thousands of miles away. He's not living in his region. He's not living in Jerusalem. And he asks uh, one of his brethren, you know, what's things going? How's it, how's it going over there? You know, because once again, he's a Jew. He's longing for his home. He's longing to be with his people. But because of their sin, he was exiled to, to, to Persia, where he's at now. And all he says is that the walls are broken down and it's burned with fire. That's pretty strong words. He's saying the, the city that God chose... David show that David conquered and chose the city where the ark was 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 laid. The city where where God was going to dwell with His people was, was a symbol of God and His presence is burned with fire. That's pretty, pretty. It's pretty emotional if you think about it. And I love how Nehemiah reacts. And once again, Nehemiah he's he's thousands of miles away. All right, it doesn't concern him pretty much. But he's a Jew. He's a believer in God, so it does concern him. I love how he how he reacts in his reaction. Verse four. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. That's what we should be doing right now, amen? Yes. So Nehemiah, he didn't say, well, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's their problem. I ain't going to worry about it. I got my own problems here. Because he did. He had his own problems where he was at. But he chose to, he said, he sat down and he wept. Now, you know, I've cried. We've all cried. But have you ever wept before? That's a, that's a lot different. It's more emotional. I've heard of people weeping. Uh, and uh, especially over in that area today, if you watch people at like, funerals and things like that, people weep. And, and, and they're on the ground and they're weeping. And it says, And he mourned for many days, as it gives us a timeline, but he was fasting and praying. So his entire just, just state of mind just changed. He, he quit eating. He began praying and said, Lord, how is it that your great city, that my region, I'm going to use that word region a lot this tonight, how is it that my region is burned with fire? It's destructive. Now back in those days, uh, a wall was a sign of power. It was a sign of protection. And all of that, it was a sign that your God, whoever your God was, was with you because your wall was so big. Um, so not only that was, so not only that, he was worried that people were going to view that my God is nobody. By the way, church, our God is somebody. He's alive, he's able, and he's powerful. So not only was he thinking about what he was facing, but he's thinking about what people are going to face, look at his own God. And how God's going to be, uh, how He's going to be looked at differently. In church, I believe this, and I've said this out many times. You are Jesus Christ to somebody in your in, in, in your life. You know, you know, walking in the store, the way you react. You know, people. I tell you what, I, I believe this. People watch Christians like hawks, especially during this COVID nineteen pandemic that happened. People watched us like crazy. How are we, how are we going to react? Are we going to be afraid? Are we going to cancel church? Well, sadly, we didn't. A lot of us didn't pass that test. And I'm very proud to say that the mint stayed open as long as it did. You know, there were rules that were in place and laws that Jane will tell you the same thing. But at the same time, though, people watch us to see if our God truly is real. People do. We can be the stumbling block for a lot of people if we're not doing the right thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, if I'm at work and, and I get mad and I say a bad word, I'll tell you what, people watch me because I people know. You know, when you say I'm a Christian, people automatically are going to have this 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 predisposed notion that, all right, I'm going to watch Josh. If he messes up, then his God's not real. So church, I'm not trying to give you any pressure, but people watch us. People are watching the church right now to see, you know, is it really real? Is God truly there? Is there really peace in this world that we live in? And by the way, there is. There is. But sadly, a lot of churches don't have that. But they're living in a, in a hypocritical lifestyle. I hate to say that, but it's true. But I love Nehemiah's reaction here. He was fasting and praying. And as I read that, I thought to myself, when our region is broken, it should bother us. That's right. We shouldn't just sit in the church a pew and just... And we, we need to come in and get filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that, but at the same time, how many times we come in here and then we leave and we just keep on forgetting what's going on in the world that we live today. Guys, I mean, people, babies are being murdered. 
And homosexuality is running rampant in the church, not just outside, but in the church. Guys, that should bother us. It should shake us to the core. So Nehemiah didn't just say, well, you know, whatever. But what he did was he fasted. He knew that there was something that he had to do. And I believe that's why he was fasting. And so I believe that right now as the remnant people in the state as we live, that if our region's suffering, it should break our heart. That's it right. really should. Yeah. You know, I tell people all the time, walk out these doors and, and put on a different set of eyes. Right? You know, how many times we kind of we kind of change our eyesight a little bit. We, we, only, we only look at things we want to see. But put on a different set of eyes and you'll see a different region. A region hurt. You'll see people that uh, who need the Lord Jesus Christ. I see people all the time that are, you know, they have the will work for food signs, and we see those a lot. And what we always do, we always make excuses, right? Church, we can't do that anymore. We got to, we got to show the love of Jesus Christ, no matter who it is. Because I don't even taste something. One act of love can change a lot of people's lives. It's true. We can't just let this region just, just pass us by. We have to have some sort of. It should alarm us. It should wake us up. And let, know and realize that we have something to do. It should give us a sense of purpose, responsibility. Because by the way, as a Christian, you have a responsibility to your region. Do you believe that? Say amen. amen. It's true. It's very true. And the church has done a really bad job of filling that responsibility. Yeah. You know, you, they want you to come to church, but you got to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. you got to believe the way we do. Guys, we can't do that. I want people to come in this church with who they are, but I want them to lead differently. Amen? I want them to lead change. So, so Nehemiah... He realized that he had, there was a purpose he had to do. He didn't know what it was, but he was praying and fasting. And he was seeking God because he couldn't stand to be in his home in, in Persia knowing that his region was being ravaged by destruction and by fire and by the enemy. Verse 5, And I said, Pray, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, who you keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandment. Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night for the children of Israel your servants and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you command your servant Moses. So Nehemiah's not, he's not, he's realizing I'm where I am now because of my sins. So he's talking, he's getting personal. He's not talking about the Israelites. He's talking about himself. He said, I've sinned. I've acted corruptly against you. In church, we all have done that. Amen. Yeah. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, but aren't you glad His grace is sufficient? I praise Him so much for that. Because I'm probably the worst one here that sins against the Lord. But I'm glad that He's always there and He loves me and wants to bring it back into His good graces. But remember, I pray the word that you command your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, Yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen and the dwelling for my name. So simple, ain't it? It's just a simple concept. If you believe in God, if you believe in me, do my commandments, you will, I will bring you together as one nation. But if you forsake my commandments, I'll scatter you as, as far as I can scatter you. And I tell you what, right now in this region, the church is scattered. It's divided. Amen. We live in a divided culture. This region is divided so much. And, and I was driving down the road to you know, quite a bit, and you, you, you drive three miles and you see 16 churches, amen? That's kind of comical, but it's true. 16 churches in probably less than a mile. And all of them were started probably because somebody got mad and they went to start their own church. We're so divided. And I found that even too, you know, preaching myself, you know, I used to travel and preach is that, you know, even these churches don't even talk to each other. They have no idea who they are. They don't even get together. They don't even worship together. They don't even, it's, it's the little, little things that keep us divided. So, so we live in such a divided region. So, but I, I'm calling that fallen in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. That we can be united together yes. in one cause, which is Jesus Christ. Forget about doctrine. Forget about religion. Forget about theology. That stuff doesn't matter anymore. That stuff is destroying the church. What matters is we fall under the same name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for our sins. His blood was spilt for our salvation. That right there should be the only factor that binds us together. Amen? Yes. And so I believe that. If we can come together in one accord, then God's going to do a mighty, amazing thing. Can you imagine if all churches work together in this region? Shh. Amazing change would happen. I'm true. I believe that could happen. I believe that, church. I really do. I believe that God, not only in this church, but he's, there's remnant all over this region in different churches. There is. Don't just think it's just us. There are people, I know for a fact, there are people in other churches rising up and realizing that, you know what, I'm done with religion and culture and tradition. I want something greater and I want something deeper. And that's what God's going to give them. Verse 10. 
Now those are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day. I pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. So he says, let the Lord be attentive. By the way, the Lord's listening to everything we say. His, his ear is attentive to us. He knows what's going on. A lot of times we act as if... Uh, you know, God has no idea what's going on, but He does. He knows exactly what's going on. But I love what He says, Be attentive to your servant. We need more servants in the house of God. Nehemiah was a servant. He was willing to serve the Lord. And how can we serve Him? It's easy to... Uh, you know, when God calls us to serve, that's when things change a lot. It's easy to come to church and you know, sing the songs and, and worship. But those things are great. But what about when it comes to serving the Lord? That's a different, that's a different thing. People don't like to hear about serving the Lord. Amen. In fact, people don't like to hear about responsibility. That's a big word. You know, when Jesus Christ saves you, he, he, there's responsibility you have to Jesus Christ. It's not just a one-time deal. You get saved and that's it. But He requires of us. So Nehemiah felt a sense of responsibility, a sense that he had to serve God in some capacity. Yeah. And it says that he was the king's cupbearer. Now, that word cupbearer, now, you know, if you've seen movies and stuff, what his job was was several things. One, to bring him a drink. Two, to see if it was poison. He would check the drink to make sure it was poison. That was a very had to be a very uh, uh, agonizing, stressful job, knowing that every time you took a drink, it might be your last. Um, but it was a job that only the most trustworthy person was receiving. So Nehemiah was a man of trustworthiness. He was a man of integrity. He was a man that you could trust. You could believe in him. So that word cupbearer, don't look at it as a small thing. That was actually a huge deal in this time. And all of that, he had access to the king of Persia. He was in his courts. And so that, that word cupbearer is very, very important. It's not a small job. It was a huge job for Nehemiah. Uh, for chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Xerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad, since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. I mentioned it before. We need sorrow of heart when it comes to this region. And I meant to mention too, so what is broken in our region? Well, the first thing I, I thought of the Lord gave me was the churches. The churches are broken, amen? And God did not intend for the churches to be broken. But what happens when man gets its hands involved? We break things as, as soon as everything else. Just like Adam and Eve broke what was really going to be perfection through eating the fruit. So culture, tradition, and religion has broken not only church leadership, but the impact church has on a region. Used to, a church was a very powerful force in the region. It really was. You, I mean, I, I even talked to people who were criminals who said, I didn't even want to drive by a church because I, I was convicted by it. But now people just look at you churches as another building. I didn't have a place to waste space. And that made me realize, man, what would what have happened? The church needs to be a church of impact in this region. Yep. The second thing that's broken is our homes. And that's a huge one. Alcoholism, drugs, poverty, but more importantly, uh, complain. This is this is what's really breaking our homes. And if you know, you might think, "Well, I live in a good home. I don't drink alcohol, or do drugs, or this or that." But if you're complacent in Christianity, your home is suffering yeah. more or less. Amen. Come on, I need amen right there. That's 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 good preaching. Amen. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm one of them old school preachers. They always say that's good preaching, you know. But it's true. When we're complacent in our faith in Jesus Christ, then our our kids are affected by. It. I got two sons who or three sons who are depending on their dad to lead them spiritually. Now, am I always going to do the right thing? No, I'm going to be imperfect with a lot of things. But they need to know that our home is a home where God is center stage in everything. Right. That the Holy Spirit is alive in our yes. home. By the way, the Holy Spirit that's here can go to your homes. They don't just stay in this church. Yeah. Yeah, you don't believe that. I believe yeah. it without a shadow of a doubt. Don't ever think that the Holy Spirit's just confined to church. It can be in our homes, in our workplaces, everywhere it needs to be. But our homes need to be God-centered and God-ordained. Our schools are broken. Our, our schools are broken. Amen. Not only that, our, you know, they're teaching our kids things that I can't even, I can't even fathom. I don't even want to even mention it. The stuff they're teaching our kids, gender things, and I'm just, I'm just naming off a few things. But our schools are broken. Used to, my dad said that every morning before school they always read the Bible, and they said the pledge, and they read the Bible every single yeah. morning. What is happening to our schools? Yeah. Our kids now are not even. They, they're not even getting anything worth of importance at school, and you know. And I'm not saying school's bad. We need to learn to have education, but church, we need to have a Christ-centered school system yeah. where our children learn who Jesus Christ is. Because you know what? I, I even believe this with my boys. I don't care if they ever 
graduate to eighth grade, but if my boys have been baptized in the Holy Spirit and served Jesus Christ, I'll be as proud as them as I would anything else. Yeah. I believe that. So our schools are broken. And then lastly, our area leadership is broken. And how do we know that? We'll turn the news on, open your Bible to any book you, you see fit, and watch the laws they're passing. I guarantee you, 10 out of 10 of the laws they're passing is against the Word of God. That's when you know your leadership is broken. Amen? Yeah. I'm telling you, there are debates going right now at the local level of things that I wouldn't even think was even, even debatable. Killing the unborn. You know, that's just, can you believe that? So our, our leadership is broken in this area. So those are a few things that, that are broken in this region. But what I love about this is, and I'm not reading this stuff off to make us feel bad, I'm reading it to give us a sense of responsibility and urgency that we can be remnant builders for Jesus Christ. That's right. Thank you, Lord. Next verse. So I became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? And I wrote down, I put a little arrow beside that verse, and I wrote Abingdon to Morristown. Because that's what James said, right? Abingdon to Morristown. That's our region. That's our Jerusalem. That's our city wall. It's burnt. But he's afraid. Then the king said to me, What do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. If you noticed, God never told Nehemiah to go. He chose to go. God never said to Nehemiah, it wasn't like a Moses thing, where he said, Moses, I chose you. Nehemiah chose to go himself. So I think that's a great lesson to learn there. And Nehemiah said, you know what? I'm not waiting for the Lord to tell me. I'm going to do it. Now, by the way, lean on the Lord's will. Let the Lord guide you. At the same time, if there's a need, we need to feel that need. Amen? Yeah. We're His hands and feet. Sometimes we kind of sit back and say, all right, Lord, I, you know, it's so I use the old analogy. Let's say you're on a boat and somebody's drowning and you have a life jacket. Well, Lord, is it, is it your will for me to throw this life jacket? You might want to throw it out there pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm just saying, you know, that's just my theory. You know, if there's a reason, if there's something broken, you know, and we know we have the authority to fix it. In the name of Jesus, do it. So Nehemiah said, Lord, I, I know you're going to be with me, but I'm going to move first. I want, I'm going to be the one to be sent. And he says, I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen also seemed beside me, how long will your journey be? and when, when will you return? So, that, so it pleased the king to send me, and I sent him a time. Furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river that they must permit me to pass through all till I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's force, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, for the city wall, for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. As I read that, if we're going to rebuild this region, the king's hand's got to be part of it, right? The king Jesus Christ. So he said, I really need some letters. And what these letters were for was, when I get to an area that's maybe not too friendly, if I give them this letter, they'll say, all right, let them go. We can't touch them. So, you know, so that just shows me that when we begin to rebuild this region, there's going to be enemies attacking us, right? Amen. There's going to be, there's going to be opposition. But through the king who's going to lead us, he can't touch you. He can't stop you. It's going to happen. And he knew that. Not only that, he said, I need the best materials I can find to rebuild my region. He says, I need some letters to the king's forest to give me timber. So not only will God offer his protection, he's going to give us everything we need to rebuild this region the way it needs to be. Amen. He's going to give us the best of what, we, what, he, what he can give us. And by the way, God's best is beyond our comparison. Yes. So rebuilding requires the king's hand. And if you ever want to rebuild anything, the king has got to be involved in it. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Verse 9, Then I went to the governors of the region beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. When, now here's the opposition. When Samuel the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite, official heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had, to come, had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. Hmm. You know, opposition. There's always opposition, right? Any, any time in the book of in the Bible you read, there's always opposition. So, He's going, and he, he's heading towards Jerusalem, and this, this man named Sambalot, he, he's going to be the, the thorn in Nehemiah's side. He don't want him to see the, the wall rebuilt. He don't want to see the wall restored. He's going to be opposition. You see, right now, Satan's going to fight, fight tooth and nail because right now he's king of this region. In his mind, he is. Mm -hmm. If he can get people to be in, embedded in sin, and more importantly, I believe this too, he might not be able to stop us from believing in God, but if he can keep us from doing something for God, he's still winning a huge battle. Amen? Yeah, that's truth. That's truth right there. 
You know, God, you know, oftentimes the devil can't persuade me to believe in him or to, to fall from God. But if he can get me to just to keep my mouth quiet, sit, and not do anything, then he's won a major battle. And that really, now I'm speaking to myself. I'm just, I'm not, you know, pointing anything out, but I do the same thing. How many times do I, sit, I stand and I do anything? Not only that, you know, how many times in, in worship that, you know, God said, please praise me, say something about me, and you don't do it. Who just won that battle there? What, you know, so, so it's true. That the devil can't keep you from believing in God, but he can definitely keep us from working for God. But there's always opposition that's going to happen. And, you know, we faced opposition in this call. You know, my family the past few weeks with Michaela and Cruz and then the baby and all that, this and that, and we can call that opposition. That was definitely a, 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 a roadblock or whatever you, want, or however you want to look at it, but you know what? We're stronger going through it because yeah. God's grace was, was evident through that, that crisis. Um, you know, I'm sure each one of us has had some sort of, of uh, opposition that we faced. You know, the devil especially, he's always there. He's always rearing his ugly head. But no matter what opposition you face, God is so much more greater than anything we ever face. The King of the universe. We serve the King of the universe who made everything in this world. Yeah. And uh, everything the devil does, by the way, is orchestrated through God. The devil has no power to just to do what he wants. God has to give him the authority, just like he did Job. And I was reading Revelations a couple of weeks ago, and I love reading Revelations because you want to know why I like it? Because I, I get to rub it in the devil's face and say, you know what? You think you go power? <laughs> at the end of time, you ain't got nothing. Yeah. Your, your end get, result is going to be destruction forevermore. So when I read that book, I don't read it like some people do and you know all this and that. I read it to get some encouragement to know that you keep messing with me, all right, you keep on having fun because one day God's going to deal with you and it's going to be bad. And He knows yeah. His end result. Yeah. The opposition knows the end result. I think it's amazing that God is He's planned everything out. But always be ready for opposition. It's going to happen. But don't let it stop us from rebuilding this region. Verse 11. So I came to Jerusalem and was three, there three days. And I arose in the night. I had a few men with me. I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Nor was there any animal with me except the one which I rode. And I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent, the serpent well and the refuse gate and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down its gates which were burned with fire. Then I went on into the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal under me to pass. So I went up into the night by the valley and viewed the wall. Then I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the others who, didn't, who did the work. Then I said to them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste, and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God which has been good upon me and also of the king's words that he has spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. I love that last verse. I'm going to read it again. Let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. Yeah. So it wasn't an easy task. So, so Nehemiah walks through the streets and he... He, he's seeing everything that's going on, and it's, it says right there in that verse that it was so bad that even his donkey couldn't get through. And so, but you know what? He's never deterred. He said, I told them of the hand of my God, which has been good upon me, and also the king's words that he has spoken to me. So God's hand is upon all of us. Do you believe that? Amen. He's always working. He's always moving. No matter the, 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 the stressful situations we face, God's hand is always upon us. He's always doing something. He's always making something happen, no matter what it is. And it takes me a long time to realize that. You know, I was talking to Ron about the equipping phase, right? I don't I ain't gonna lie to you. That, that's a hard phase as a believer, is the equipping phase. And I'm not the best at it. But you know, but the Lord always reminds me that I'm with you, Josh. My hand's upon you. I got you going. You're alright, but just 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 keep on going. But that last verse, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. So they you know, they didn't say, Well, they just said, Let's rise up and let's build. Let's rebuild this region for Jesus Christ. That was the main theme of everything. Let's rise up and build. We can't be lazy anymore in our faith in Jesus Christ. It's easy to get in that complacent, lazy attitude. We have to be workers and builders. Yeah. Um, you know, how do you build a house? Do you just sit there and just just comes to pass? No, you have to have to build that house. You got to go find the wood. You got to go find the materials. And you got to build that house. You got to put work into. It. After you finish building that house and you look at it, it's a beautiful thing. It's a, it's a masterpiece. You know, it's just like an artwork. You just sit there and the artwork appears. No, you have to put time and effort into it. And Nehemiah realized that if I'm going to see my walls stand again, if I'm going to see my region thrive again in the name in the, in the Lord God, 
um, and believe in the Lord, then I got to put work into it. And I got to make sure that I'm doing my part. So Nehemiah was a man of work, he had a work ethic for the Lord. Verse 19. But when Sam brought the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and get Jeshem the Arab, heard it, they laughed at us and despised us and said, What is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? People are going to laugh at us. They are. They're going to laugh at us. I just be honest. They're going to poke fun at us. You know, what are you talking about, Randy? What, what, what's going on there? They're going. To, people are going to laugh. They're going to mock us. But you know what, though? We can't let that get to us. I love how uh, Nehemiah answers this, and I, I'm going to go kind of in deep with it. So I answered them and said to them, "The God of heaven Himself will prosper us. Therefore, we His servants will rise and build. But you have no heritage or right of memorial in Jerusalem." So what he said was, "You ain't got no right to be here." So you can just shut your mouth. I'm just, you know, an old Tennessee fashion. <laughs> but I like that. He said, you know, and, and as I read that, I got a, a sense of power. You know, God, God gave me this. He said, religion has no right in this region. Yes. Poverty has no right in this region. Yeah. Drug addiction has no right in this region. Pornography, sexual addictions, uh, broken homes, none of that has any right in this region. In the name of Jesus, we call that fallen. Do you believe that same amen? Amen. And that's what he said. He said, I'm rebelling against religion. He said, you may laugh at us, but you have no right. You have no heritage here. This is my home. This is my this is my region. This is God's region. He's called me to rebuild it. So when I read that, I just thought, man, that's what we need to do. When we have opposition, we say, you, you know, devil has no right here. This is not his home. This is not his area. We need to reclaim it in the name of Jesus Christ. So religion has no place in our region. It's so true, you know. And when I, you know, like I said, we can we call that rebuke in the name of Jesus Christ. Right? That's biblical. We can do that. That's what God's called us to do. You know, my wife's taught me so much about that. You know, we have a lot more power than we think as believers in Christ. You know, oftentimes we know that God is powerful, but we leave it there. We go, well, God can do it, or God can do it. But I've learned through Haley and through Rhonda and through the people in praying and Lisa and all them, you know, and I learned through that men's retreat that I went on, I learned that we have power through Jesus Christ. He's given us authority to do so many amazing things. And so, yeah, I'm not speaking that we're, we're great or, or, or mighty, but we have power that we don't really realize or we don't tap into like we should. So, so that's what Nehemiah realized. His God was more than anything else. And he had that, and that was power that, to help him for this good work. So let us remember that we serve a God who not only is powerful, but He can give that power to us to see a region change. Amen? Yep. Never forget that. Chapter 3, verse 1. We're, we're getting down to the... Uh, I'm trying to condense as much as I can, but we just want to show you what, how this is happening. Then Elisha, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and hung its doors. They built as far as the Tower of the Hundred and consecrated it. Then as far as the Tower of Hananel, next to Eliashib, the men of Jericho built. And the next to them, Zakur, the son of Emery built. So I love how the first person he mentions who built the wall was what? A high priest. So I, as I read that, I thought, Lord, what's that mean? You know, and I was praying, so what's that mean? You know, because you mentioned the high priest first. You didn't mention, you know, just anybody. You didn't even mention Nehemiah. Why did you mention a high priest? I think, and God told me, he said, because Josh, I want to rebuild my church. Yeah. The high priest, that was a symbol of, of, of the religious leadership. Now, when I say religious, I'm not talking about what religion has come today. But as I read that, he, he told me, they said, Josh, I'm going to start the church. I'm going to get the religious leadership. I'm going to get it to where I want it. No more is it. It's not going to be religion anymore. It's going to be a relationship between me and them. So it started with the high priest. So this man who was in charge of the worship of God, the praise of God, the, the sacrifices of God, he was the first one mentioned to build the wall. So as I read that, I just, it just, he just, he just threw that out there that it's going to start here in the house of God. Yeah. I want to reamp the leadership of this region, the church leadership of this region. Before I do anything else, before I touch the, the, the congressman, the Senate, before I touch the President of the United States, before I do anything, I'm going to touch the men of God who sit behind pulpits, who preach the Word of God. I'm going to touch those who sit in the church pews. I'm going to start there. So I think it's amazing that he began with the high priesthood. He started there. Because the high priesthood had become corrupt and dangerous. It had become something that God didn't intend. And aren't you glad that we have a high priest in Jesus Christ? And you don't have to go through a high priest anymore, but we have Jesus Christ making intercessor prayer. But the high priesthood had become so corrupt and so far from who God was that I believe that you know, that was appropriate. That was the high priest, the first one mentioned, to rebuild the gate, to rebuild the wall in Jerusalem. And through this chapter too, I won't read all of it, but through this chapter... Everyone, no matter what job they were, no matter what background they were, they began to build. And how they built this wall was is each person worked on the section in front of their home. And so, and, you know, we all know the story. They built this wall in over 50-something days. It was, it was actually a marvel 
they could build this wall that fast, but because people had a mind to work, and they were working, not only were they helping themselves, but they were helping other people working, and they were making sure their region was being rebuilt. And so it's amazing how uh, when people get together in the name of God, that things can happen, how things can change, and how things can uh, truly just, just be world-shaping. Do you believe that? Now, East Tennessee is real small in the scale of the world, right? The world's a real big place, but you know, this can be the beginning, the epicenter of a revival. It's really yes. can. I, I believe that a shadow of a doubt. Thank you, Lord. I mean, what can happen better than the revival belt instead of the Bible belt, amen? Oh. It's true. <laughs> if you get revival here, just imagine how it can spread all yeah. over this world and this nation. Yeah. So don't ever think small with the Lord. Don't ever think that, well, East Tennessee, there's not much we can do. We, this can be the beginning of a great revival, a great uh, movement for Jesus Christ. But yeah, this entire chapter just talks about the, the building and how they use the best materials and how they put so much work and effort into building this, this wall and they completed it. Now chapter 4 talks about the enemies coming. I will look at those enemies here. Uh, verse 1. But it so happened when Sambalot heard that he, they were rebuilding the wall that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. The devil's furious right now because he knows. Not only that though, this is the latter days, I believe. it. We're, we're, we're getting into this game. This is the fourth quarter if you want to use that term. And the devil is getting more mad and more mad because he knows that his time's up. He's going to work even harder to see people fall. But he is mad. He's mocking us. But who cares what the devil says? Amen? Because my God is more, more powerful than he is. And he spoke before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Whatever they build, if even a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. So he's saying, no matter if they're, okay, let them build it, but even if a fox goes up against it, it'll fall. That's what the devil tries to do. He tries to say, uh, the work you're doing ain't going to work, it ain't going to matter. You know, just don't worry about it. He goes, it's not strong enough, just, just, just let it go. The devil's a craft, he's crafty when it comes to lying, amen? And by the way, he's the father and the author of lies. That's what the word says. But yeah, we still, sometimes we still listen to him. Hear, O our, our, oh our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their hands and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. Verse 6, So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up and half its height, for the people had a mind to work. I love that. Mind to work. We need a mind to work in this, in this call. Amen? We need to. Jamie has a mind to work. You know, every time he, he gets up and preaches, he, there's a, he's in a mind to, to work, to work on this call. So, as us as believers, we have to have a mind to work. And what is that work we need to do? So many different things. First off, we need to praise the Lord, worship Him, read His Word, pray, and, and fast. And on those things, we have to have a mind to work. So, it doesn't matter if the enemy is attacking us, we have to have a mind to work in this room that, that we're in. Now, it happened when Sambalot, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed. The gaps were beginning to be closed. I mentioned earlier, there's gaps in this region and they're going to be closed in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? They're beginning to close. I know it. I could, I could feel it. This is, this is biblical model. Gaps beginning to be closed. And all of them conspired being restored and the gaps were being to be closed that they became very angry and all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. The devil is the author of confusion. He wants to confuse his people. He wants to confuse or confuse God's people, I mean. And he's, he's done it so much these past few years and within months. And, um, and he is people now, they're confused. They don't know who God is or what church is. They don't know who they are, what gender they are. God, the devil is a, uh, he's the master of confusion. But let's not get one thing straight. There's one thing he can't confuse us on, that Jesus Christ is powerful, He's our Lord, our Savior, and He died for our sins. There's no confusion about that. <clears throat> Don't be confused by this Word. This Word's true and real. What I'm saying really happened. I'm not reading stories that were written down. This is stuff that's actually happened and is biblical model and true. So don't let the devil confuse you, confuse who you are or what your purpose is. Yeah. Oftentimes, it just could distort what we are in God's in, in, in mind. You know, he'd say, well, I can't really get, you know, Rhonda to, to, you know, to, to get on my side. If I can confuse her in a relationship with God, I can keep her where I, where I need her to be. Yeah. So don't be confused by who you are. You are a child of the one true king. He loves you. He, he adores you. And he wants nothing more than to do what's right. He wants to bless his people. Do you believe that? Yeah. He does. So don't be confused by anything the devil says. Verse 9, Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God, and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. 
And Judas said, we need to be watching and waiting. So, so they, it shifts here. No longer are they building. Now they're having to fight and build. So uh, I, I, usually, I like to think that they had a hammer in one hand and a spear in the other. So they've got to build the wall, and then on the other hand, they've got to fight off the end. And guys, let me just tell you something. That's, that's spiritual warfare 101. You've got to build in one hand. You've got to fight with the other. And it's not always fun because let me tell you something. The devil fights, he fights. He's like a raging wolf, and he won't stop. But you've got to fight. You know, I, I'm, in, I'm in the army, and you know, I, I was trained to fight. We're, we're soldiers of God. This is we're in God's army, and uh, what do soldiers do? Soldiers fight. There's a spiritual war going on, and uh, you know, spiritual warfare is one of those things you don't hear much about anymore. It's kind of they don't teach it much. It's kind of one of those iffy subjects, but spiritual warfare is real. It's real as it gets. But these people now are having to not only build but having to fight. So you can imagine just how tired they are. All these days of picking up brick and then having to turn around and having to fight off these enemies, but they realized that they didn't do that, that their building, that their mind to work would be gone. They had to keep on fighting. <clears throat> Verse 10. Then Judas said, The strength of the laborers is failing, and there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. You know, God's people aren't failing. We're getting stronger, I believe. Yeah. You know, that wants us to say that. Man, it's. You watch the news, and you myself, I've caught myself doing it. I mean, Lord, we're just getting weak. Church is getting weak. I don't think we're going to ever recover from this. But then God realizes, uh uh, we're strong. There's, there's still a mind to work. Don't ever doubt that. And so Judah, the, the men that were against uh, the building, they thought they were just trying to make excuses. Well, they're, they're weak, they'll fall quickly. They didn't realize how fervent and the zeal that Nehemiah had, and how they were willing to, and, and to build and had a mind to work. Verse 11. And our adversary said, They will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. You know, I'll say this. If I fail the Lord, His work will continue. You believe that? Yeah. I'm not saying that to say that I'm, you know, but if I, if we fail, the, God's work is going to continue because God, it, it, He's all pursuing. He never stops. Yeah. And so, you know, I want to be a part of His work. And I'm praying the Lord He'll give me a part in it. But to, no matter what happens, to me or us or anything, God's work will continue on. This Bible, no matter if I forsake it and leave it, this Bible is going to keep on going. And uh, that's one great thing about the Lord. His work will never stop. It will continue, and no matter what. Verse 12. So when it was when the Jews who dwelt near them came, that they told us ten times from wherever place you turn, they will be upon us. Therefore I positioned men behind the lower part of the wall and the openings, and I set the people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. Not only is they're threatening the building, they're threatening the families of these people. So I can imagine men yeah. having to fight for their families now. Not only are they fighting for the God, they're fighting for their families. And you know, the devil has no right on my family. He has no right to attack my family. But as a man of God, as a man of the house, I have to fight with one hand and pray with the other. Amen? Yes. And read the Word. So not only are they having to, are worried about the wall being destroyed, but they, they're going to attack the families too. Yeah. The devil will use any avenue he can to stop this good work. I'm telling you, He will. No matter what it is, He will use it. But don't be afraid. Follow it right here. Uh, don't be afraid of them. Remember, the Lord great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. You know, we're all as believers in Christ, we're all a family. You believe that, right? We have our families, but we're also a, a, a family of Jesus. We should fight for one another, no matter what. If I come in and I'm, I'm, I'm just having a horrible week and the devil's really fought me, I, 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 I want to know that I can count on believers in Christ to lift me up and to fight for me. And I believe we can do that. You know, oftentimes I've met people, believers who were so downtrodden and beaten down, they couldn't fight for, they couldn't fight for themselves. They needed people praying for them. And I think it's a beautiful thing uh, as believers in Christ. So if you ever see someone in, in, in this call or anywhere that is just so beaten down that they even, can't, they even can't defend themselves, what do we need to do? We need to be intercessor for them and pray for them. And I've seen that. These Saturday night prayers we've been having, I've seen intercessor prayer like I've never seen before. Because some people can't pray for themselves. I've met people who just were, I just can't pray. I just can't get on my knees and do it. But I know people are praying for me right now. Guys, being a prayer warrior is an amazing gift from God. And uh, it's, it's powerful. Do y'all believe prayer is powerful? I do. Yeah. You know, if you don't come to Saturday nights, then you're missing out. Prayer is amazing. I've seen it uh, firsthand. Um, when I was overseas in Kuwait, my wife prayed for me, bless her heart. She probably prayed for me so much. And my, my mom and probably Ron, everybody in here probably prayed for me. Uh, you, you know, and, and, and got me home safely. But I, I felt their prayers. I felt I, I literally felt their prayers. I could feel them every single day. And even, you know, even when I'm like, you know, I do believe that 
God gives people discerning heart. I believe if I'm having a bad day but don't say anything to nobody, God's like, Lisa, pray for me. God does that. Has he ever pissed them on your heart before and you, you don't know why, but you're like, well, I need to pray for them. And then you find out a few days later they were really going through a tough time. And through that prayer of obedience that you gave to the Lord, that he got through a real tough time. So, so not only Nehemiah was building the wall, but he was building a new generation to fight for one another. A new generation of uh, believers. And guys, let me tell you something. On this earth that we live, you know, we have God and He's our number one. We also have each other and lean on each other. Yeah. Lean on each other through these tough times. I'm telling you, it, 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 it happens and it helps to know that no matter what I go through, I can lean on someone to pray for me when I can't pray for myself and can't defend myself. Verse 15. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had bought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. So it was. Amen. That's pretty awesome, man. So they, they God gave them the sermon. I, I'm gonna tell you, they're, they're plotting against you. So they already knew about it. So the enemy, he, he can't even get a pull, pull, the devil can't pull a fast one on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Everything he does, God knows about. Do you believe that? He knows everything. I'm telling you, he knows everything. I'm, I'm I am blue the devil. He, he could tempt Job by himself. He had to go ask God for permission, and God said, "Okay, I guess you can do it because I'm, I'm over you." So. Not even, the devil can't even plot against God. God knows every single thing. So when they found this plot, they didn't even do it. So I, I, it's, it's, it's funny in a way, but it's also, it's also shows you that we serve a God who knows everything and He knows exactly the, the ways of the enemy. The enemy ha can't be secretive with God. He can't, he can't sneak around God. He might be able to sneak around us, but He can't sneak around Jesus Christ. So it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at construction. While the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and wore armor, and the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. Those who built on the wall, those who carried burdens, loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked the construction, and with the other held a weapon. Every one of his builders had his sword girded at his side as he built, and the one who sounded the trumpet was beside him. Then I said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the people, The work is great and extensive, and we are separated far from one another on the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. It's beautiful, ain't it? Beautiful. So it's amazing. So, you know, spear in one hand, sword in the other. They're working. You know, he said uh, right here. He said, um, you know, our, the work is great, extensive, and it is. It's true. And uh, you know, for many years the church has gone so complacent. And you know, when, when that void, when there's a void in 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 our region that's not filled by God, I guess who fills it up? Sin. That's what the way the devil is, and uh, it's not easy sometimes to uproot the sin, uproot the, uh, the, the the culture, the religion, the tradition, the region. It's very extensive. It can take a lot of work, but no matter what, he says our God will fight for us. Yes, and that's so true. That's a very powerful phrase, and it's it seems kind of simple, but our God will fight. Yes, that's a promise that He's making. I will fight for you. I will defend you. I will protect you against whatever you face, and I believe that. Let me tell you something. There's days I just can't fight. There's days I'm like, Lord, you're going to do it. And, well, that, that should be our first option. Amen. It's the Lord fight for us. But how many times we get to that point where we're like, all right, Lord, now you can fight for me. But that's not the way it should be. But there's times I, I have, I'm like, Lord, you're going to do it. You're going to fight. I yeah. can't do it anymore. And then I realize that was the that was the best, that should have been the first option. Last few verses and we'll be we'll be through. So we labored in the work, and half of the men held the spears from the daybreak until the stars appeared. At the same time, I also said to the people, Let each man and his servant stay at night in Jerusalem, that they may be our guard by night and a working party by day. So neither I, my brethren, my servants, nor the men of guard who followed me took off our clothes, except for everyone took them off for washing. So, judging by that verse, that this rebellion was extensive. It, it was a time-consuming task. It was... It wasn't just to be, oh, you go home and then you wake up. It was every night they had a night guard. They had people that were building nonstop through the night. So you can imagine people were weary. They were tired. But you know what, though? You know, if you go through the rest of the book, and I won't read the rest of it, but if you go through the rest of the book, they built that wall. They completed it. And what that happened was it ushered in a new age for the Israelites. And, and Nehemiah became a he became remnant leader. A, a new remnant generation rose up. And they, had, they finally had that wall built. And Jerusalem uh, was finally the city that... Um, that was it was meant to be a place of worship. I want Abbey and Morristown to be a city that it was meant to be, not a city based on you know sinful lust and 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 and, and natures of the flesh. I want a city that's going to be built on God, and built on truth, and built on moralities and the values of the Word of God. That's what I want for the city, and I, I know it's going to happen 
Because the more I drive through the cities and, and see these things, the more I see the brokenness and the more I see the, the walls broken down in this region. And, you know, it's easy to say, well, Lord, you know, what can I do? But there's so much we can do as a region, as a remnant group. So I challenge all of us, you know, as we read this, as the biblical model tells us, that the work's extensive, it's going to be long, but we're called to build. He's called us to do that. If y'all stand with me, and just bow your heads. I know there's a lot of verses uh, thrown at you, but uh, that was what God told me to preach. And, and I tell you what, I am uh, excited to be a part of this call. I hope you are. Amen. I'm seeing things, but I'm seeing things. I'm seeing things move. I'm seeing people move. I'm seeing things change. I'm seeing uh, things line up. And I know God's working. I know God's moving, and and I want to be part of what He has that's coming forward. And um, you know, Jamie said this is emerged, right? And I believe we're seeing an emergence. We're seeing an emergence. Not only of just this call here, but I believe there's going to be a call all over this region. And um, I just feel led this tonight to, uh, if y'all can come to this altar, and I want to pray for the rebuilding effort that we have ahead of us. Now, before we can rebuild this region, we've got to rebuild ourselves, right? Yeah. After we rebuild our lives. We all got problems. I I've mentioned I'm the worst one of them. We all have things that we deal with, and we got to start here. You can't re you can't go out here and you know build and, and if you're not building yourself up. Same thing, we got to rebuild our families, our homes, and that's that's an extensive task. You know, our priorities are always so misaligned. God wants us to realign those priorities with with Him, and once we do that, then can we go out? We can rebuild this community, rebuild this region that we that we see. So I challenge us right now, if we can all come this altar, you can pray there, or you can come down here, whatever it may be. I feel, I feel like we should all get together as a group of people, as builders, and pray for this region. Pray that God will strengthen our hands for this good work. Pray that not only will He strengthen our working hand, He can strengthen our fighting hand too. Because uh, I've already experienced it too, that the minute you begin to rebuild something, the devil's going to fight back. There's going to be opposition. I'll try to scare you, but if I didn't tell you, I'd be, you know, I wouldn't be being a good, a good believer in Christ to you. Because we always have to talk about the enemy, right? If you're going to fight a war, you got to know who your enemy is before you do right. anything else. But the devil wants nothing more than to destroy this region and destroy this call. Yeah. And I, I've seen attacks, and y'all can agree, I can plug around this word right now, and you can talk about attacks, attacks, attacks. But you know what? God is putting a hate of protection around us right now. I can, I can sense it. And all we need to do is just stay firm and know that He's there and uh, to give us a mind to work. That's what we need as believers right now. So I'm going to ask everybody to please come. If you can, we'll, we're going to pray uh, now at the service for this region. Um, you can pray standing up however you want to do it. I just feel like we all should come down here and, and, and pray and circle if we can do that too. But uh, I, do, I, I do feel a call to this region and um, I feel a call that He's calling us to build. Like I said, we're builders, right? Yeah. I can't build a house to save my life, but... If I, God can use me to build the region, I'm going to be able to do it. So um, I'm going to lead some prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for, thank you, thank you for the just this message, God, that you have given to us. And Lord, I, 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 Lord, it should be given by a better man. But I thank you, Lord, for allowing me to, to, to get this message. And Lord, as we come into this house tonight, we, we want to just, just lay it out there and say, Lord, you have, you have given us a mind to work this call. It's not only a call to see spiritual change, but we have to build spiritual change, not only in our own lives, but our families' lives, and in this region. And Father, our prayer right now for each person that is here, and for those who aren't here, God, they will understand, no, that we are called like Nehemiah to go, and we need to rebuild this region, rebuild these walls. Well, there are, the walls have been destroyed through sin, through, through the lust of the flesh, through, through tradition, religion, and culture. And Father God, in the name of Jesus, we rebuke that right now. And I rebuke the attacks of the enemy against this region, the strongholds that's gripping this region from poverty, from alcoholism, to whatever it may be, Father God. And I pray that as, as the believers, as, as remnant leadership, as remnant people right now, that we can rise up like a Nehemiah did, with the spirit one hand and a hammer the other, and can go forward and we can fight and build to see this region restored once again, Father God. I thank you, Lord, for the biblical model for the story. And I pray, Lord, that when the devil rears his head against us and opposition comes forth, that we can not be discouraged and quit, but that we can fight even harder, that we can raise our spirits even higher, and that we can call out to you, Lord Jesus Christ, and say, Lord, you are going to be my defender. You're going to be my protector. Because, God, you will fight for us. That's a promise you've made us in your word, and you've never let us down, Lord Jesus. 
Father, I know that you're lining things up and I believe strongly that we're entering into a time when we're, the rebuilding process is going to begin. I believe that without a shadow of a doubt. I just pray that you will help us to be ready and to be willing, God. And like I said before, give us a mind to work. Give us a mind to, to just go at it no matter what. And give us courage and strength to do what we can, Lord Jesus. And I thank you, Father God, for this message. I pray for these people around me right now. We bless and want them, Lord. May your Holy Spirit be evident in all of their lives and in this place, in our homes. I pray that you just bless this call. Bless Jamie, Samantha, and Noel, Father God. Bless their ministry they have, God, as He leads us, Lord, through this region. And help all of us, God, to back up our pastor and his family, Lord, no matter what he's going through, to pray for him, Lord. And help us to pray for one another. Help us to form a community of believers who can fight for each other, Lord, even when one person is too weak to fight for themselves. Father, we just pray right now for this, Lord Jesus. We love you so much. We thank you, God, for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for who you are and for what you've done, Lord. And Lord, I'm praying right now. I'm to, Lord, I'm, I'm going to give you praise for the victory already because you are going to change this region, Lord Jesus. I see it as clear as day. And so Lord, I praise you right now, Father God, for the lives that's going to be changed, for the souls that's going to be saved, for the absolute just reawakening of this region. Lord, this revival is coming, and I'm praising you right now in advance for how amazing it's going to be, Lord. I praise your name. God. We yield to you. We give it all to you. In Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. Oh, my turn that way. <coughs> Anybody have anything you want to say? Or, um, I, uh, I, I have something I'd like to say. Um, I, I head up the gospel community of the Northeast Tennessee. We were meeting here on Sunday nights, but it's um, summer. So we're going to be meeting at my house, and it's open for everybody. And this is exactly what we're doing. We're going out this summer. To the highways and to the byways, preaching the gospel, going to the brokenhearted, saving the lost, just preaching the word, rebuilding, rebuilding. And so I invite you. Um, I would really love to have you come and preach at Lake Day to give a word. I'll talk to you about that later, though. Just something that the Lord, as you were preaching, I thought, hey, it's kind of Lake Day. We're gathering at the lake. Um, on the 17th of uh, July, but I just, I need people to know that we do have a community that's active in our region. And we are teaching against uh, the strongholds and the spirits and the things that the church won't teach. So um, just keep me in prayer as I lead this. I have a guy coming uh, all the way from South Carolina to join the gospel community because We've got so many people that the Lord has brought into the region, but they've come here on his unction, and now they're just kind of sitting here. So uh, we need to pray for the people that the Lord's brought here, that they seek him. Now that they're here, now what? So um, we do have a lot of people coming, and the Lord is doing a lot out there in our communities from Abington to Morristown. And I've been in contact with a lot of different churches and people from there. And we, as this call, I would hope um, that at some point we can unite. I've been praying for the churches to be united for a year and a half now. That's been one of my big prayers that, because we do need to come together. If we are going to, um, you know, save our region, if you will, uh, we need to come together. We need the churches to come together, the leadership of the churches. And the Lord has laid it on my heart to uh, put together an empowerment conference here. And I have no clue what that means. I mean, I know what that means, but I don't know how to do it. So just know that God is working in the hearts of the people of his servants here to rebuild that wall. And the gospel community is a part of that. Um, so if you'd like to come, I'd love to have you. You don't have to come every Sunday, but if you want to be a part, there's a, a Facebook group so you can keep up with what's going on. And um, I would just love to see you tell your friends and say, let's go check this out because these people are doing something. So, because uh, it's that time of year. So, thank you. I'll say one more thing, I'll be done. But um, I was looking at Riley and Daniel and Samuel and Noah. What about when they get older? What are they going to face? Yeah. What can I do yeah. now as a dad to sort of relieve the. The, the, the burdens that they're going to have. You know what I'm saying? Right. Four tears, you know. Because um, 
and I love my boys to death. One thing I don't want them to have to face is things that I could have prevented through working for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And so, because uh, you can imagine those people who were exiled in Babylon and Persia, why, why were they exiled? Because their dads and their moms were following the Lord, and they suffered for it. Um, you know, I believe in generational character. I believe in that. It's true. You know, If I do something wrong now, it can affect my kids. So, you know, so think about the young ones, the young generation yeah. that come behind us. What are they going to face? You know, you know, we can reverse those generational curses. Mm-hmm. You know, there's and we put so many curses over ourselves by our words, just the things that we proclaim. So, yeah. Well, if nothing else, I love each one of you guys. Have a wonderful rest of the week. Uh, y'all are dismissed.